a little bit more of a quirky talk than you're probably used to, because I'm a hobbyist um, and I'm not a professional. And, and um, I was going to say, if you're going to go down my GitHub, um, I thought that we'd have this um, talk before pizza, so that'd be okay. But after pizza, you know, I might get a little bit sick because of the, uh, the spaghetti code that I have and all of that. And you know, I use Excel, so I think we all have these little tools. And I use this Excel. To, I always use Excel to keep lists of various things. These are a bunch of uh, bunch of um, web services that provide nodes, um, hosting nodes. And the one thing that I always found frustrating about Excel is that um, it, it didn't have track changes. And I think I lost the mic. Yeah, there. So whenever I would change something here, because this does not exist, this RIP version, OpenShift version doesn't exist. I want to track changes on Excel. Um, so I went and built this little app that I actually, you know, that I like, um, which I called um, Listery, which basically has the same thing. And um, I have my little um, table here, and I can change things and put RIP here and save it. And basically, um, my little Excel sheet has um, the history of the changes. Uh, so I can keep track of them. And I think this is the coolest thing. Uh, you guys probably don't. <laughs> um, but the point here is that I'm showing this because whether you're one of you guys, like a dev who can whip up an app like this in like half an hour, or you're a newbie that wants to, um, that you know, takes three months to build some sort of very easy front end web app, um, we should all have kind of a space where we can actually have our, um, our apps running on a server. So let me just get this presentation going, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, there we go. So that's my example of my, my listery, which I call kind of a poor person CRM. Um, but the idea is that, you know, it would be I, what I would like is to have a personal server that hosts a bunch of front end web apps where I have my data and my files sitting on my server, right? And I want this personal server to be easy to install where I can have, in, um, uh, where, where I can easily build apps and install apps and run your apps and my apps. And these are not complex apps with, you know, really um, complex backend processes. I'm just thinking about there's a bunch of apps which just need access to a file system and a database. I want to be able to install these really easily and I don't want to be locked in. Um, and that's important because if I have my personal server and I have my data and my files, I, you know, I want, if I'm running it on Amazon one day, I want to move it to Google or to Heroku or wherever, and that portability becomes important. And the example is that actually a year ago, I signed up for this, you know, to, to create a node server on, on AWS, and I had this one year of free, um, um, free time, basically got this sort of, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of free server time. And the year ran out and I started getting bills. And literally, it took me like five minutes to take my little freezer server, which I call it, and move it over to Google. Now, from your perspective, you're like, well, yeah, that's easy. You just you know, go and change the DNS text records and stuff like that, and you're done. And this is sort of, I have my own sort of um, uh, uh, URL, uh, salmanff.com. So from your perspective, that's easy. But if you think about it from a kind of a more of a newbie consumer perspective where people have their own apps, that's like the total opposite of kind of the model that's on the web today, right? Model on the web today, you're kind of there, you have nothing, you have no portability, the services are, the web services are out there and they have your data locked up. And a lot of people are talking about this because of Facebook, and I'm not saying these services are bad, you know, these are wonderful services, but I'm just saying it'd be nice if we had our own servers where we had our own data and we had our own apps and we could actually sort of move things wherever we wanted and we had full control over our apps, our data, our files. So how do we get there? Obviously, you have to have a personal server. You're going to have to build it on Node, right? Because <laughs> Node is so cool. And because, most importantly, because it's multi-platform. So you can run it on multiple different service providers. You can have it just local hosted and you can have it on um, um, on your own sort of server at home or in the office. So that's, that's really, for me, the great advantage of Node is sort of the multi-platform. And so you can basically host it anywhere. You need a database. I've worked mostly with MongoDB, again, partly because it's open source and you can have it in different places, but really you'd want to kind of have it be, um, you'd want your server to be 
database agnostic um, effectively because you don't want necessarily to have complex or you want to sacrifice the complexity of the database operations for um, the portability. Um, and and that's, that's key. And then you want a file system and you know, whether it's L L S3 or Dropbox or what have you. Um, and uh, Dropbox is an interesting one, especially for newbies. You guys probably have never used Dropbox. It's kind of a files, uh, file system on your back end. Um, and again, from a newbie's perspective, even if you have all of these, and the idea is that, you know, is it possible for a newbie to have all of these set up really easily? Even if you have all of these, you still need something which I call middleware, which I started to build, which is called, you know, Freezer, which is basically kind of a, a middleware for allowing you to just build your front end app and just say, for example, you know, upload file or write to DB and then everything is taken care of whether you're running on S3 or on Dropbox or whether you're running on Mongo or another database, you want that to be abstracted, right? You don't want to deal with that complexity. I mean, you guys want to deal with that complexity, but I'm just thinking about kind of newbies or hobbyists sort of having their own, their own servers. So also my criteria for choosing the best backend is probably a little bit different from the way you guys would look at it to some extent, um, or you guys being developers within a sort of a corporate context, um, but perhaps not as hobbyists. Um, so, you know, looking for a friendly UI, um, you know, no CLIs, you know, sort of all click, click, click. Um, you don't want lock-in, we talked about that, that's really important. And you, you want a free tier, sort of you're thinking about consumers and, and uh, sort of a hobbyists effectively. And what happens that a lot of these, as you guys know, uh, a lot of these services are really geared towards professionals like you and not necessarily for, for hobbyists. So they add a lot of complexity and they're really looking for you to give you a free, free tier and then charge you 200 bucks a month, which is nothing for a company, but for a person it tends to be a lot. Um, so these services are geared to that audience and not for a personal server. So you have to kind of hack your way around it effectively to get a personal server that's easy to install. Um, and what I like to say is like, I, you know, my, in the ideal world, the, the server should be as easy to install as you signing up for GitHub or for Dropbox, right? That's kind of the, the goal and the ideal. Um, so you, you want some features like HTTPS if you're putting your own sort of um, um, your own, uh, you know, important data on there, what have you, and you want custom domains, so like, you know, minus salmanff.com. Um, so when I switch, switch servers, that domain remains there, and, and, and my, the URLs that I may have are still the same URLs, effectively. So I kind of went through a bunch of the, the different services that offer Node, Mongo, et cetera, um, uh, to, to, um, to everyone, and especially if the way, and. Uh, try to judge them by the, that criteria, the criteria of this is for somebody who wants this to run as easily as setting up, setting up GitHub or, or Dropbox. So the most interesting for me is OpenShift, which is run by Red Hat, which really within six clicks, you can have a node server running. You, like, you sign up, you click, you know, sort of the starter, you open console, you name your project, you create project, uh, you, you browse a catalog, uh, OpenShift sort of combines Node.js and MongoDB, so you have that option, you click on it, um, and you sort of point it to a GitHub repository of your kind of server, your Express, et cetera, your, or your Freezer, as I, as I call my little server, and you go to Next and create, and you have your Node server. And that I find is amazing, because it's almost like a consumer experience. Um, you have to do another few clicks, like if you want things like HTTPS and things like that, but really within you know, like six to nine clicks and two text boxes, you have a Node server running. Um, one of the problems I find with OpenShift um, is that uh, it actually sort of, it works in, in, in theory, but I think a lot, like a lot of these services are really geared towards not the personal server, but really towards the professional person who wants to have a server. So a lot of times, actually, this, the Mongo node combination runs into resource constraints, and they're trying to sort of push back and prioritize other constraints. So you have to kind of redeploy, you actually get into some, some technical issues around redeploying the server to get it running. But I'm showing this to you just because the interface is so, and I don't know, how many people have used OpenShift here? No one, yeah, so it, it, the interface is very, very consumer friendly. And if actually you, and um, one of the interesting things about it is that, so for, you know, a lot of these things are running off of Docker right now. You reboot Docker and you lose effectively your environment if you just have a server running there. Uh, and you need a way to actually have persistent va environment variables effectively if you're doing it this way where you're sort of pointing to a public repository to, to grab the server code. 
in fact, until like six months ago when they weren't on Docker, they provided this amazing experience where literally within the same sort of workflow, it, within two minutes, you had your server running with a file system and a database and with these persistent variables so you could do whatever you wanted with it. And for me, that was like, that was amazing. And then they, they, they phased out of it, went on to Docker because it was much cooler and much better oriented towards their corporate customers. But for the newbies and, and for the hobbyists, there's, uh, there's other alternatives. And Heroku is a great one as well. Um, you basically you know, have a few clicks. You create the app. You um, give a name to the app. And what Heroku does, I mean, it gives you a few options. But one of the things that it does is that it allows you to actually use Dropbox in order to get, um, uh, get your server files deployed onto their servers. Um, and so here, basically, you have, you know, Heroku on your Dropbox, on your on your um, on your on your on your Mac or or, or PC, and on and on the um, and on the uh, uh, in the cloud, it creates this sort of like Heroku uh, folder and puts the name of your application, and then you can put whatever um, Node files you want in there or JavaScript files you want in there for it to run, sort of um, deploy the server, and you just basically press deploy and you're done. Though, again, in this case, the server um, shuts down every once in a while because they're limiting free resources effectively. And, um, and so you kind of like, you need to sort of copy the environment variables in there effectively so that you can actually have a sort of a persistent, um, persistent environment where you're not sort of resetting everything at every time the thing restarts, which is basically, you know, every, every two hours or so. Um, but it's still, you have a server in like, in like you know, nine clicks or, or what have you. Uh, which I find amazing, but it's only a server. There's no database. And the easiest um, database setup that I've seen, Mongo setup that I've seen, is uh, MLab, which, again, is incredibly user-friendly. Um, and again, six clicks and a name. And you, you, know, you choose Amazon. Again, it's a sandbox environment, so you're not talking about huge robustness, though even like I've had a couple of hundred megabytes running on my, um, on my server. Um, on M Labs, and I haven't had any problems in the, you know, in the past year or so. Um, so it, it is pretty robust. So they, obviously, they would like you to go beyond the beyond the free tier, which is which is fine. Um, and you just press continue. You you give it a name, and you submit an order, and you have um, and you have a, a, a database running. You define your user and um, and a password, and basically you get a URI to Mongo, which you can then um, as easily as that. You have a URI, which you then you can put in your whatever server software in order to be able to access that, that database. So you have a you know, sort of Heroku, and you have your database. And what you need is, um, is a file system. And actually, Dropbox is quite amazing, because um, if you go to dropbox.developers, you actually, again, you know, four clicks, and you generate an access token. Again, that access token is something that you can put in your, your server um, software, effectively, to get your environment running. So, um, again, all of this is, um, for me, the easiest way to, as, um, to get to running a full server file system and database um, without having a CLI and without having a complex process to get things running effectively. Um, there's an easier way, actually, to get a file system, and, and I'll get to that. But, um, you know, sort of going back to my list tree, so, you know, I mean, Again, I don't know. I, I'm sure you guys use uh, you know Google Cloud or, or Atlas or, or AWS here um, a lot, right? Yes, um, I imagine. Um, and you know, I mean, AWS is great, and, and so is Google Cloud. Again, I think the criteria that I've kind of used to judge these is to say, well, how can we get to a personal server that you can run up within a few clicks and have apps running within a few clicks. So basically, I mean, in my experience, again, MongoDB Atlas, which is, which is great and robust, really is geared towards, is really pushing you towards sort of the, the corporate user and not the hobbyist, um, as, as this presentation is, 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 uh, is, you know, is, is looking for effectively. Um, and AWS, we talked about, I guess, as a newbie, again, sort of if, if there are newbies out there, um, I find the, the AWS Elastic Beanstalk to be incredibly user-friendly as well because you have a user interface. You kind of upload the code, and it deploys it for you. Um, and again, with a, within a UI, which is web-based and is not complex. Again, that's sort of the criteria for getting this running so you have your personal server. Um, so 
sort of back to this, anyway, the, the idea is, you know, having a bunch of apps running on our server, our own servers, with a database where you, we can keep our data and a file system where we can keep our files, obviously running off of Node. Um, and sort of talked about the services for running Node and database and a file system with a very easy interface. And then the question is sort of, you know, is there, you know, you need something else in the middle, which is the middleware. And basically a front-end API, which allows you to again write, say, you know, write this data point and for it to abstract away what database you have in the back end or what file system you have. Um, and then so you have the sort of the FSDB connection. You want to be able to manage the, the app installations, um, manage the users, and this is a personal server, but you want to have like, you know, friends or family within that, within that environment. Um, and sort of manage the permissions. I think the idea of having your own personal server with your data on there, with your apps and data on there is because, because you want that data to be f free for you to have other apps interact with it. So I may have, so I, for example, I built this uh, little sort of browser uh, plugin, which is, um, which I call ViewLog, which basically sort of logs all your data. And the idea is, you know, uh, Google and your telco provider and everybody seems to follow you and know every website you've ever been to, but the only person who doesn't have that data is you, right? So you might as well have it and put it on your own server. So if you're going to do that, then maybe you're going to have an app that interacts with that data and does something with it, right? So you want to sort of permission that so that these apps can interact and, and access your data, but within your environment, not within the environment of a... Um, um, of somebody else's servers. And, and that's a, the concept of, um, concept of a personal, personal server. Um, and once you do that, so this is where, you know, <laughs> you and the computer wouldn't even cooperate to start, so forget about doing a demo, right? <laughs> but, because um, everything is, um, so basically, you know, I, I took you through, um, we're gonna try this. Um, so basically, if you've gone through um, sort of setting up MLab and setting up, um, setting up uh, your freezer server um, on, on Heroku, for example, as this is the case, so you get the sort of, you know, you get your um, LNUG live, which is a code word for it to crash, um, .herokuapp.com, and then you say, okay, well, there's no, there's no server, there's no database, or there's no file system. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an external database. Um, and I'm just, this, I had pre-filled this before, before it crashed. But um, basically, you take um, the URI from MLab, and you basically fill in the various little things here. And hopefully, I didn't make any typos. And basically, you've set up your database. For your external file system, actually sort of, you can also, instead of going to develop Dropbox.developers, you can actually just have it OAuth effectively. So basically, you, you, OAuth, um, you authenticate the server, and, um, and um, in your Dropbox, basically, you can have uh, a, let me just allow this. Right. Basically, um, I've now gotten an access token, and the idea is just, just um, you know, Salman FF, my server, just acting as a as a as an OAuth provider, um, and anybody else can actually provide that. So the idea is not to lock in, but to actually have anybody be able to provide an OAuth, so that you can actually now have within your um, uh, sorry within your Dropbox, right? You now have apps. Basically, you have a freezer app um, which you can work with. Um, because you just OAuth that, and under Heroku you have this LNUG Live, which has your, your system, right? And then you just call, sort of, put in a pass name and password, and you set, you know, sort of the Dropbox access token is there, and you set parameters, and your server should be running if the world cooperates, right? And you launch Freezer, and so basically, with the screenshots that I showed you, and, um, and this sort of simple um, process for having your own, um, for having the, the environment variables become persistent, you have a, a server. And what do you do with this server? So, um, 
we're just gonna, I'm just gonna do a little demo here where, um, you know, so apps are basically, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS files, right? So if you wanna create a, um, an app, basically, you can go to, let's go to downloads, I'm gonna create a, um, lmog.hello, right, oops, sorry. I'm gonna create a new folder called that, and then I'm gonna create an index.html, right, and I'm gonna create a little div here, say hello lnod, and I'm gonna name it id equals hello. Um, so basically, um, this becomes an app, and if I go to downloads, all I need to do is to zip this up, and back on my freezer server, I can go here and just say, okay, so I have, I'm gonna take this file and upload it, and that becomes my app. Um, so that's, your app is now installed on Heroku, effectively and um, you have your hello, hello world. And what's cool about that actually, because you have this Dropbox backend effectively, um, again, for um, making things simple, now under LNUG Live, sorry, under Freezer, you actually, under user li your user apps, you actually have your index HTML. So your, your, your server environment is replicated on, uh, via Dropbox on your desktop effectively, right? And if I can do one more thing, I'm just gonna actually, um, so the other cool thing about doing these apps is actually you can have a um, Electron app which runs the, runs the same code. So this is my note-taking app that I have on my, on my freezer server. So I'm not gonna like try to type this out live. So basically, um, obviously any app like index.html, you can have an, um, sorry, um, <laughs> I can go to my Dropbox apps, and I go to my user apps here, and in here I just do index.js, um, and I copy and pasted this code. Basically, just you know, this is the sort of the abstraction or the API that says, "Hey, write to the database, right?" And then just query the database. So it should be that simple for a newbie who just set up a server in 15 minutes just write everything else is abstracted. And now that I put it on my Dropbox, um, even though I'm live here, right, um, basically it's just writing to the database and querying back all the results showing that, again, trying to make it really easy to um, have an environment where a newbie or a non-techie can have their own servers, can upload their own apps, whatever that app is, and, and build their own apps effectively. Um, so around that, there's also, like I said, permissioning, so different apps can, can um, access each other's data with your permission. Um, and if I just go to my little conclusions page. So, um, so you know, the, 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 the question for me was, you know, is it easy enough to set up a standard kind of con um, consumer server, consumer-oriented or newbie-oriented server? And no, not really, but we're pretty damn close, and that is quite amazing, that a server with your database and, and file system can be set up basically through the web with a few clicks, right? And a couple of copies and pastes. Um, and if we have that, well, why not have a common middleware, something like Freezer? Now, Freezer, you know, I'm like a hobbyist, you know, it's, kind of, it's not, it's a personal project, it's not widely tested, I'm in serious need of your, <laughs> your work there to test this, and it's, it's not elegant code, uh, for sure, and it's not really robust, but it's a kind of a start, or maybe a concept, or a start of a concept, to say, hey, um, there is this model out there where we all have our personal servers, just like we have our Macs or PCs, and we have our apps on there, and we own and control that data, we own and control our apps, and we can do whatever we like with them. 